Day number four. Ha! Huh. Day number four. Yeah, nah. Day number four of the creativity challenge which I'm posting on Instagram and on YouTube. I'm reading from my memoir today, Sex, Drugs and Mostly Yoga, Field Notes from a Kundalini Awakening. And I just randomly opened to this page and this feels really, this is, this is hard, this is vulnerable for me, this is exposing. Um, when I first published this book, I was absolutely terrified when I published it and I didn't really do that much promotion because it was just too emotionally challenging to lean into. And five years later, I'm starting to do a little bit of promotion. Um, yeah, so here we go. <clears throat> this is page 93, and the chapter is called, I'm a One Man Woman. Whistler, 2004. Let's go back to Vancouver in September 2004, the acute psych ward of Lionsgate Hospital. There I am, in a single bed, beside the doorway, leading into the corridor of the ward. There are three other beds in that room with me. I feel her now, that woman, me, waking up for the second time in a psych ward. The first time had been a month earlier, right? So it's a month after that. Only this time, she's not waking up from a bad acid trip with her fiance sitting anxiously beside her. She's waking up alone and remembering that he's left her, that there were no drugs to blame and that she's all alone. I can feel myself then, that moment of coming to and everything flooding back into my mind and into my heart, into consciousness. I was emotionally distraught but trapped because there was no way I could allow myself to be vulnerable in front of strangers. This was one of my deepest unconscious fears. I was scared, terrified to be vulnerable. And so I was caught between my need to feel and my fear of feeling. So I couldn't cry. I couldn't allow all the emotion in my heart to be felt, to move, as I desperately needed it to. And this time, I couldn't blame the drugs. The only drug I'd ingested in the previous four weeks was the medication I'd been given the first time around. And that terrified me. If I could lose my mind and it wasn't because of the acid or the mushrooms or the weed, what was it from? What had triggered it this time? Emotional upheaval, being dumped by my fiance. Life, just fucking life. And if life could trigger psychosis in me so easily, did that mean that there was something seriously wrong with me? Was I mentally ill? Was I bipolar? Was I fucked up? Maybe there had been no awakening after all. Terrifying. Then, that woman I was in the psych ward that second time was also so unaware and unconscious of what was going on in her emotional landscape. Only her behaviors and the train wreck that she'd made of her life had the ability to reveal the truth. Now, I'm highly attuned and aware of every tiny internal shift. Thanks to relentless self-observation, born of a desire to wake up, fueled by a fear of going crazy again. Because I never did go crazy again. Not once in the last 13 years. 20 years now. Those were the only two times I experienced psychosis, although they weren't the last times that I experienced trance states, similar to the trance states that I entered into during the awakening experiences. In the past two years in particular, remember I'm writing this in 2018, right? So I'm referring to like 2016 to 2018. I've learned how to journey deeper and deeper into trance states in a way that allows me to access and process the deepest, darkest corners of the psyche and also to access the collective unconscious. I've found myself in 
eerily similar situations to my psychosis, only completely anchored, centered, and sane. And if someone was there with me, I'd be able to give a blow by blow description of what I'm experiencing internally, like a scientist observing a science experiment. Case in point, I'm in Auckland, in Newmarket. I'm driving out of a car park to go head back to Langhorne to pick my son up from school. It's an everyday, mundane activity in the life of a single mother. Only I'm hit with a strong wave of kundalini energy and suddenly I'm channeling a masculine energy through the right side of my body. It's a strong wave. My right lip curls up. My face changes shape and I can feel malevolence echo through my body. I know this energy. It's been coming through me since Mr. Toastmasters. So when I wrote the book, when I referenced partners, I gave them a name because I, you know, like I wanted to protect them as much as I could. It's been coming through me since Mr. Toastmasters and I lived in a damp one bedroom flat in Newtown. It's an energy I used to see move through him as well. Is it him? An entity? A physical representation of an emotion? I don't know. This is tricky landscape to navigate and there's no one guiding my way. And until now, I've been hesitant to reveal too much of what I experience because people might think I'm crazy or bipolar or schizophrenic or experiencing a multi-personality disorder. I'm none of that. And I know it. These experiences come through me. They are not who I am. And as long as I stay anchored and connected to that which I truly am, I'm okay. By the time I hit Motorway 16 going west, the malevolent masculine energy has faded. I note as many details as I can about the experience, collecting data, looking to learn what I can so I can better understand the experience. Field notes, science. Because this is what I am, a scientist in my internal landscape, my body, mind, emotions and energy is my laboratory. Of course, it's impossible to be objective. Yet science is now proving that subjectivity is all we really have and that the mere act of observing something changes the thing being observed. Objectivity does not exist. Instead, I prefer to examine my experience through the lens of potentiality. So the strange energy I experienced that day, potentially it is an entity that I first witnessed in somebody else. And that entity can now enter my energy field. Potentially it's some kind of energetic hallucination and I'm just making shit up. Potentially it's not an entity, but the energy of that person who I first saw it in. All potentialities are possible and I attach to none of them, although I may have a preference for one or two. And that may be the distinction between a crazy person and a person who experiences multi-dimensional reality beyond the norm. Crazy means believing your own shit and becoming attached to something being true. Navigating the multi-dimensional nature of life with maturity means being willing to examine everything and attach to nothing. I experience life in a different way from most people. This does not make me mentally ill. This makes me super fucking sensitive, gifted, talented, a seer, a medicine woman, clear sentient, clear boy, and possibly clear audience, and I'm definitely clear cognizant. <laughs> Bring on all the clears. It's frightening at times though. Both the multitudes of energies and realities that I experience in the ways I cycle through intense emotion as I process the past of my experience, the now of my experience, and sometimes even the future of my experience. And yet, I've also become 
fucking amazing at it. I'm a highly skilled emotional processor and the skill is what makes me an amazing retreat leader, an amazing facilitator. I'm able to feel what's happening in people's psyches and guide them with a light touch to process their own experiences when their will says yes please. At the time of writing, I was still having moments of doubt, big moments of doubt. Moments where I'll have been feeling like absolute shit for days, mired in deep fear, unable to access the root of the distress and I start to wonder, <gasps> maybe there is something wrong with me. Maybe I do have a medical condition. Maybe I am bipolar, fuck. But then something will break open. I'll get to the root of the fear. I'll be able to fully feel it and release the insight that deep fears always contain. And I'll break through and up into the light again, more whole, more integrated and more wise. <sighs> Made it. After a while, thanks to my relentless self-observation, I begin to pay close attention to those doubt-fueled fears. Maybe there is something wrong with me. Maybe I do have a medical condition. Maybe I am bipolar. And I notice by paying close attention that these thoughts invariably precede a big breakthrough by about mm, 24 hours. Now, when those thoughts float through my mind, instead of believing the thoughts or even wondering if they might be true, I feel excited because I know I've almost made it through this particular emotional process. I'm just 24 hours out from a big breakthrough. Stay the course, almost home again. Now that's progress. Hmm. And what's really interesting, because like I said, I wrote that in 2017, 2018, and it's very, like I, it doesn't take days anymore. Like when the, whatever, the shitty, shitty, shitty feelings start to come up now, the ability to just choose to go right in and feel them fully, one, there's a sense of wonder and awe and sweetness. Two, it only takes generally a couple of hours, if that. And three, those particular thoughts, the fears, right, the doubt-fueled fears, they haven't come up for years, right? And so that's the progression. That's the progression that I noticed. And this is what is so interesting about having written this in 2018, is in so many ways, it's a snapshot in time of how I was perceiving and framing and working with my life and those experiences, you know, that I'd had. And I know, like, if I was to write, and it's quite possible that I will, if I was to write another memoir as such, it would be so different, have such a different vibe and feel, because I'm so different again now, you know, five or six years later. And that this is the nature of work, is that when we are doing the deep, deep work and integrating all of the things, how we show up, even how we look, shifts and changes. You know, if you go back and you look at videos of me from, you know, 10 years ago, whatever, five years ago, there's a lot of variance. There's a lot of variance and it depends so much on where I am in the internal landscape and the types of energies that are coming through me. So as a creative, and this is what this creative challenge is about for me, like for so long, my identity as such was really wrapped up in spirituality and awakening because that's the path I was walking from, from my own, you know, health and well-being, but also I was teaching that. But creativity has always been a huge thing. Like this is the third book I've published. I've written probably six or seven books. I haven't published them all. And now I'm in this phase of really reclaiming creativity and stepping into that. And yeah, if you're interested in getting this book, you can find it online. It's on Amazon, etc. It's on Audible. You can listen to it. It's me reading the book. Um, and I am going to go talk to Book Mountain here in Squamish and see about getting it there. It is at Armchair Books in Whistler. They have a couple of copies left, I do believe. Um, yeah, over and out. Day four, creativity challenge. Woohoo! Let's go.